Okay, hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you're joining us from today. My name is Sylvia Levy, and I'm the Communications Officer for the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health, or ANH Academy, and the IMANA program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today for our very first webinar in our new series on drivers of food choice in low and middle income countries, a synthesis of evidence. This series is co-hosted by the ANH Academy and the Drivers of Food Choice program at the University of South Carolina. Our team is very excited for the series to kick off today with our first session on understanding how and why people make food choices in low and middle income countries for promotion of sustainable healthy diets. This series will include one session per month for four months and we invite you to join us for as many as you can. Finally, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few technical items so you all know how to use Zoom and participate in today's webinar. First, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the ANH Academy website. All participants have been muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat box. I see a few of you already have. And let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization you work with. Please also rename yourself in, Zoom, in the Zoom call with the name you'd like people to use. You can access the chat box by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Later in the session, we will open up the conversation with a quick uh, question and answer session, not a quick one, um, 30 minutes actually. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session. You can send your questions at any time and we will do our best to raise them during the Q&A. If we have time, we will also ask you to raise your hand so you can ask your question using the audio function. If at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your in uh, internet connection. And if you get lost, please try to reconnect to the webinar using the same link. So that is it from me. And now it's over to Sunita Kadiala, Principal Investigator of the IMANA program, Co-Director of the ANH Academy and Professor at LSHTM for some welcome remarks. Hi everyone, a very happy new year to all of you. Um, as Sylvia said, I work with the, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I work at the intersection of agriculture, nutrition and, um, and food systems. And um, today I'm really excited to, um, to kickstart at this point, the first of the series of the Drivers of Food Choice webinar series. Um, before that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what ANH Academy is. Uh, for those of you who do not already know what it is, it's a global network and a platform for sharing research and evidence, uh, foster capacity strengthening and collaboration across diverse disciplines of agriculture, economics, sociology, nutrition, public health, epidemiology, and so on. It brings together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers working for better nutrition and health through improved agriculture and food systems. The academy is about four member uh, members strong. For, sorry, four thousand members strong, and uh, they're from all over the world. And we have an estimate of about one hundred and thirty nine countries from which these four thousand members come from. The academy offers several opportunities, such as like these webinar series, uh, as we are a part of today. Uh, we have what are called technical working groups. Please do check out our, our website for that, and several capacity strengthening opportunities and. Um, um, and then annual interdisciplinary disciplinary research conference. This annual uh, conference or a meeting on agriculture, nutrition and health brings together uh, the community together into what is called the ANH Academy Week. Uh, it has two days of learning, lab, two or three days of learning labs. The format keeps changing as we're also going online and, um, and at least three days of a research conference. Please do join us online for this year's Academy Week, which starts on 21st June and ends on uh, 2nd July. So please do uh, have once again a look at our website and, and or if you have any questions about the, the dates and so on and so forth, please do let us know 21st June to 2nd July. So hope we'll all see you there again. And of course, in the intervening Drivers of Food Choice seminars. 
Um, we did launch a call for abstracts for the conference yesterday and I encourage you to submit your research uh, abstracts by 28th Feb to be considered for oral or poster presentations for the ANH Academy Week. I hope you're all the members of the ANH Academy, but if you're not, please do sign up to take advantage of these opportunities and also to keep abreast with the latest developments and what we have on offer. The ANH Academy is one of the work streams of a program that I lead along with many other people who are a part of this program um, also on the webinar here today, which is called the Innovative Methods and Metrics for Agriculture and Nutrition Actions or IMANA. And it is led by the London School LSHTM in partnership with Tufts and University of Sheffield. So um, the NH Academy itself is a larger partnerships, for example, Drivers of Food Choice has been our one of the fundamental partners um, with uh, through through many years of the NH Academy Weeks. The CGIER's program on agriculture for nutrition and health is another example. About this webinar series, of course, you'll hear more from Ed, um, Ed Frangelo and Christine Blake on this as well as uh, some uh, fantastic research undertaken by our researchers under this program. So thank you for joining us today for this first webinar series. Um, and as you have already heard, this is a four part series which will focus on drivers of food choice in low and middle income countries. We hope you can join us for the rest of uh, the series and share information uh, about these webinars to your colleagues and, and people in your network. Um, throughout the webinar, please stay active, um, use the chat function, um, as Sylvia say, will say or has already said, and, and also um, raise your hand. I'd like to thank uh, the DFC team, Drivers of Food Choice team, for uh, reaching out to us like, once again for this collaboration. Uh, we know what a great program it is and the research that's coming out from there is, um, is it's very, very uh, important and very informative. Um, and is laying foundations for uh, for the next generation of drivers of food choice research. So thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to to be a part of this journey with you all. And now um, I pass on to uh, Ed Frangelo, Professor Ed Frangelo from University of South Carolina, to introduce our uh, speakers today. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you, Sunita. Uh, and good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, and, and welcome. Uh, and we're pleased to be collaborating with uh, the uh, Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health Academy for this seminar series. But the motivation for this for this seminar, uh, this webinar series, is is the motivation for uh, the Drivers of Food Choice program uh, as a whole, which is that we know there's rapid transitions occurring in agriculture and in markets, in food systems, in low and middle income countries. That, that type of transition has already occurred in many middle, uh, uh, middle to high and high income countries. And a consequence of that transition has been that there's been a rise of obesity and chronic diseases like, like diabetes because uh, the public's been faced with many, many more choices and shifts from traditional foods systems into um, more market-based food systems. And, and so several years ago, uh, some insightful staff members in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK recognized that there was a need for building some knowledge about how choices and why choices are made about food in low and middle income countries and that such knowledge would provide a basis for then determining what are some ways in which we might go about uh, managing this transition in such a way it doesn't lead to the same kinds of consequences that occurred in high income countries which result in uh, higher rates of disease and, and many societal costs. So uh, the Drivers of Food Choice Competitive Grants Program was created. Uh, the University of South Carolina, led by Christine Blake, um, won the bid for that, um, that program. And, and so we've had the opportunity to, to work with investigators uh, across Asia and Africa um, on this program. We, uh, over two rounds of solicitations, received more than 600 uh, concept notes or letters of intent, which 
is a testimony to how much interest there is in this topic um, and ultimately funded 15 projects in 10 different countries. And so the webinar series is to share with you uh, some of what's been learned um, through the work of these 15 sets of fantastic um, investigators um, inside uh, countries in Africa and Asia and also partners outside. So we'll begin, uh, Christine Blake will give the first uh, talk as part of the webinar today uh, with an overview of the Drivers of Food Choice program and some thoughts uh, about that. And then we'll continue with two other presentations about uh, work done in, in countries. So Christine. Great, thank you, Ed. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And I wanna start off with my present, before I start my presentation, a couple of quick pieces of business. Um, today I've included uh, a couple of interactive questions in the presentation and to participate, you can access menti.com. Um, the link is in the chat as well as um, the code is posted right here. If you don't have access to the chat right now, it's menti.com with the code 164704. Um, and to participate, um, use the direct link, go ahead and respond to the questions at any time as I begin, and the results will come up later in the presentation. So also one other point I wanna bring up before I move into today's presentation is um, be sure to register for our next webinar in this series of Perspectives on Food Safety as a Driver of Food Choice, and that's scheduled for February 8th. And now it's my pleasure to share with you today um, some of the key learnings that have emerged from the Drivers of Food Choice Competitive Grants Program. Um, I'd like to thank my co-investigators, Ed Frangelo, um, as well as the team listed here for their contributions to this presentation. Also, I'd like to thank our funders, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So to begin, what is food choice? So food choice, is defined as what encompasses the processes by which individuals and households decide what, how, and why to acquire, store, prepare, distribute, and consume the food that they do. Food choice is limited to what is available and accessible, and it's integral to the social economic expression of identities, preferences, and cultural values that ultimately influence dietary intake and health. Now a quick, peek at how we're doing here with our, with our interactive. So uh, the question I posted was, think of the last time you purchased food for yourself or your household in two words or short phrases, why did you buy these items? And as you can see here, we've got about 54 people responding and the words jumping out, the drivers and for sort of uh, uh, thoughts you have about what drove your purchase decisions were taste, healthy, nutrition, nutritious, I had seen essential in here before, routine, discounted, affordable, et cetera. So a variety of, of considerations. And for those of you who've had a chance to answer the second question, um, the, think of the last time you ate today in two words or short phrases, why did you consume this instead of something else? Um, similar overlapping drivers, but some slightly different contextual answers right in the center there, it was available at home. So the decisions were already made at the market, the purchase decisions and the choice for some people, um, other drivers around taste, health, availability, preference, et cetera. Now think about how these might change under different circumstances. Globally, livelihoods and food environments have been changing rapidly with food choice happening at the nexus where individuals meet the food environment. Urbanization has accelerated over the last 20 years, corresponding with changes in livelihood that have implications for food choice with foods becoming more purchased with about 50% in rural areas of Africa by value being purchased, food um, becoming more perishable, particularly meats, dairy, and fresh produce increasing in um, uh, commonality in the diets and food is becoming more processed and prepared. And this transformation is not just an urban middle-class story, it's broad in rural and urban areas across Africa and Asia and across the income distribution. 
So our interest in this work is oriented toward achievement of sustainable healthy diets through action at all levels, in particular um, contributing to effective policies and programs. And sustainable healthy diets are accessible, affordable, safe, equitable, and culturally acceptable dietary patterns that are health promoting and have a low environmental footprint. Achieving optimal and sustainable healthy diets requires understanding how people make food choices in these changing food environments, specifically what, how, and why people eat the way they do. But action is hindered by limited knowledge of what drives food choice in changing low and middle income countries. So the objective of today's presentation is to sum summarize some of the key learnings emerging from the drivers of food choice competitive grants program portfolio to guide future action on promotion of sustainable healthy diets. And in this four part webinar series to be delivered over the next four months um, and to include presentations from many of the DFC project investigators, we will share evidence for drivers of food choice and patterns of social, cultural, and economic change that drive food choice in low and middle income countries. So the original purpose of the DFC program was to facilitate, synthesize, and disseminate research to provide a deep understanding of the drivers of food choice among the poor in developing countries in South and Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The DFC program included 15 projects across 10 countries. And today I will present a brief overview of key learnings, or actually I present a key a overview of key learnings from these 15 projects to date with more detailed overviews of two DFC projects in Guinea and Malawi as examples of the types of data we had available for synthesis of evidence. Following my presentation, um, Dr. Miriam Matita and Dr. Helen Walls, and then followed by that, Dr. Sigrid wertheim heck will provide a deeper dive into drivers of food choice in Malawi and Vietnam. Each of the 15 projects examined drivers of food choice, but from different perspectives and in different food environment contexts to provide evidence for understanding drivers of food choice across LMIC contexts. The DFC program's approach to examining drivers of food choice used multidisciplinary and multi-method research designs to provide causal explanations for food choices people make about how to acquire, store, prepare, distribute, and consume foods in different food environment contexts. In our synthesis of evidence from the DFC portfolio, we seek to answer what drives food choice, the why, by answering three interrelated questions. The first, what, what is available and what are people eating? And then to understand how, how are people acquiring, preparing, distributing, and consuming the foods they eat? the behaviors, the measurable, observable behaviors, and then ultimately to get at why, what's driving those choices. Why do people make the choices they do to yield information about decision-making processes and the causal drivers of choice. Um, and such insight is necessary for effective program and policy action. Um, and the examples of research funded by the DFC program that I present below will illustrate the application of this framework for the synthesis of evidence. For example, the first study I'll talk about was led by doctors uh, Rolf Clem, Peter Winch, Stella Nordhagen, Sadio Diallo, and Alpha Umar Berry. They sought to depict how artisanal mining livelihoods impact food choices with a particular focus on the choices women make for themselves and their young children. They used a cross-sectional mixed methods design among in 18 mining sites in two districts in the Konkan region in Northeastern Guinea. They uh, recruited women minors uh, or wives partners of minors who were caretakers of young children, young single minors, male and female, and food vendors. They conducted both quantitative and qualitative data collection, including surveys, cross-sectional household surveys, um, mining site observations, food preparation observations, and in-depth structured interviews, as well as non-quantitative 24-hour recalls. Their study explicitly assessed dietary intake of women and children, and food availability, price, vendor, and product properties to understand what people ate and what was available in the food environment. They measured crop production and livestock raised and food acquisition and shopping practices to understand how choices were enacted. And to understand why, they assessed the influence of accessibility and affordability, convenience, desirability, and then decision-making for food purchases and spending, particularly with regard to gender dynamics 
in relation to some of the outcomes that they focused on. And so what did they learn? They learned that diets for women and children were poor in general, um, that 28% of households were severely food insecure, and that mining households had limited access to food from their own production and nutrient dense non-staple foods were scarce and pricey. And we could stop here and have a fairly good idea of the nutrition situation among these Ghanaian minor communities and, and particularly the Ghanaian miners who care for children, but they wanted to understand what is driving food choice that contributes to this situation. So the design allowed them to say something about how Ghanaian miners caring for children eat. Some participants chose to fast during work hours. Families were dependent on markets that sell processed and packaged food at levels higher than expected in rural areas. And they relied on markets rather than their own production that was consistent across um, many of the interviews. Women undertake majority of household and caring work plus substantial mining work. And when combined with a lack of safe and affordable childcare options, this put a heavy burden on women's time for young child feeding. And so to gain even more useful guidance for program and policy action, the research design allowed them to address why um, their participants make these decisions. And they learned that a key driver of poor diets was income instability. Um, and income instability was a challenge for a healthy diet that was exacerbated by some of the gender inequities, particularly in time use. Um, they noted that societal expectations around gendered roles, uh, gender roles place a heavy burden on women's time. Um, and finally, they noted that food safety concerns were an overriding um, driver of food choice and food availability with both vendors and consumers placing considerable value in ensuring that the foods are clean and safe at the generally unhygienic mining sites. And while the profession, the mining profession can afford opportunities to make substantially more money than agriculture, particularly for women, the income generation is highly variable and unpredictable, which was driving choice of um, lower, um, more processed and packaged foods, or at least the processed foods. In our second example, we look at drivers of choice from a different perspective. So this study led by Valerie Flax, Chrissy Thakwilakwa, Lindsay Jacks, and John Puka sought to identify and explain predictors of dietary intake and food choice among Malawian mother-child dyads containing an overweight mother-child or both. They used a longitudinal mixed methods design in urban and rural areas with mother-child dyads and these children were between six months and five years of age. And they specifically recruited dyads with an overweight mother and an overweight child, an overweight mother and a normal weight child, a normal weight mother and an overweight child. They conducted both quantitative and qualitative data collection, including surveys with mothers, household food logs, in-depth interviews, pile sorts, and market trip observations. To understand what participants ate, they measured dietary intake of both mothers and children and other diet-related outcomes, including food insecurity and morbidity. They assessed how mothers fed children and food shopping practices to understand food choice behaviors and to get at what drives food choice behavior, the why, related to personal intakes and child feeding. They assessed the influence of affordability, convenience, and desirability, as well as taste preference, body size preference, gender related factors, and in addition assessed intra-household decision making. They learned that compared to dyads with a normal weight child, dyads with an overweight child had a higher percent of calories from carbohydrate and intake of grains and a lower percent of calories from fat and intake of oils among other outcomes. Um, from their results, we, it tells us a little bit about the dietary intake patterns, but it tells us nothing about eating habits or drivers of choice. So to provide deeper insight, they describe how mothers obtain food for themselves and their, their children. They learned that most shopped at outdoor markets, some at both markets and groceries, and a very small percentage shop only at, at shops or grocery stores. And this was mainly to obtain the relish to accompany a stiff maize porridge, the staple food. Um, they also learned that other foods purchased included things like fruit, sweets, combo puffs, fried snacks, and sugar sweetened drinks. And that 60% of mothers bought food specifically for their young child during a market trip. And this was usually sweets, packaged um, snacks, fruits, or fried food. Um, this tells us where foods are coming from, what kinds of foods or situations might be contributing to poor diets that promote overweight. But to get more 
in-depth understanding of what's driving food choice, their results from their pile sorts and interview and surveys suggest that greater than 50% of mothers wanted their child to be larger regardless of current weight status, and that um, factors including child age, maternal body size preference, maternal taste preference, food quality, cost, household food security, and spending on special foods for children were the most consistent predictors of food, ju food group consumption for both mothers and children. And the special foods included both foods we would classify as healthy or unhealthy. So we learned from these kinds of examples how people make food choices about how to acquire, store, prepare, distribute, and consume the food they do in LMIC context. Addressing the interrelated questions of what, how, and why people eat the way they do does provide some useful insight into drivers of food choice for policy and program action. Synthesizing across the 15 projects in varied LMIC contexts, categories of drivers emerged consistently. And the relative importance, interaction, and experience of these drivers differed across the context and households. And I'll spend the remainder of my time today talking about the synthesis of evidence across these 15 projects and the drivers that emerged from that synthesis. So some of the characteristics of the food environment were consistently identified as main drivers of choice. And this makes sense, right? It's consistent with the literature from higher income countries. And as the food environment is the nexus where individual interacts with the food system, um, for example, uh, this is where we would expect to see um, some of the main drivers of choice. For example, greater access expands choice in previously limited markets. To get a little more in depth on food environment drivers of choice, um, our own Shilpa uh, Konstantinidis, along with uh, partners from uh, Imana, um, Chris Turner in particular, have worked on an analysis assessing a relationship between the drivers of choice and food environment models. And the food environment drives food choice and corresponding personal drivers that shape those individual interactions with the food environment. And these are very consistent with existing literature, but the um, emerging uh, evidence provides more context. So aspects of food availability and accessibility, food prices and affordability, vendor and product properties, particularly in relation to food quality and safety, markets and regulation, convenience and time, preferences and desirability, nutrition and health, and perspectives on food safety and trust. Broader social and cultural drivers of food choice also shape the, that also shape the food environment included social and cultural influences, especially relationships with family, peers, um, and vendors, migration or immigration leading to exposure to new foods and customs, and other um, major cultural influences. Food traditions, including specific food dishes, combinations of foods or other food customs, gender dynamics, including women's empowerment, time use, intra-household allocation, and decision-making around purchasing and cooking and the relative power within that intra-household dynamic, stability, including income, climate, and politics, and finally, livelihood change that corresponds to other wider food system drivers like climate, land use policies, tenures and tenure systems, and agrobiodiversity. In today's web webinar, we'll hear more about two projects that examine the impact of food choice um, of two policy interventions that targeted different aspects of the food environment and how that then um, resulted in changing food choice and ultimately dietary intake. In upcoming webinars, we will provide a, a deeper discussion on some of the other important drivers of choice that emerged from this program, including perspectives on food safety and trust. These were explicitly addressed in some of the projects and emerged as strong drivers in others. So we're going to spend a little more time in February unpacking what we learned about how um, perspectives on food safety are, got, are really driving choice in many of the, the contexts that we worked in. Uh, varied perspectives on food safety from six projects offer insights on some of the experiences across these varied settings. And these include aspects of food hygiene, um, trust that is built with vendors, meals prepared at home and, and concerns about the safety practices, policies and regulations, um, and whether uh, particular vendors were regulated or, or had some assurances, 
um, that their, their practices were following some um, safe guidelines. Concerns about food adulteration and contamin contamination along supply chains, and then environmental sanitation at the site of purchase. Understanding why individuals make choices in the context of perceived food safety risks is critical to developing and sharing insights with policymakers. Consumer perspectives on food safety especially impact choice of fresh versus packaged food. Um, and increased education and growing awareness of food safety in low and middle income countries, which is not always all factual or the concerns about food safety can often spread via rumor. And but um, so the concerns about um, people purchasing fresh versus packaged food, it's really important that we understand these perspectives as a strong driver of choice to help guide our interventions in the future for promoting sustainable, healthy diets. Um, and this driver has implications for things like advertising, retail regulation, fresh fruit and vegetable consumption, and ultimately our ability to achieve sustainable, healthy diets. And we'll dive, as I mentioned, we'll dive deeper into some of the findings um, on perspectives on food safety in a few weeks in February. Next, I'd like to talk a little about social and cultural drivers of food choice, including social influence of relationships with friends, peers, and food vendors, food traditions, gender dynamics, and stability. And these were powerful drivers of choice that shaped the relative importance of other drivers in decision-making. So shape the relative importance of things like prices or convenience or nutrition. And multiple DFC projects explicitly addressed how these drivers these different social and cultural drivers exerted a competing influence on decision making. And social and cultural drivers of choice are central to what we call value negotiations for food choice decision making. The influence of different drivers, for example, price versus preference, health versus social influence, or convenience versus tradition, um, are relative to each other, is expressed through that negotiation of values and it guides choice at various points. Um, in the decision-making processes. And I, I want to note here that the value negotiations are not binary and involve considerations of multiple competing drivers. The example I give are just um, some of the um, types of, of values one might discuss negotiating. So in the context of the nutrition transition, macro forces of enhanced communication and increased mobility, among others, alter aspects of the social, cultural, and food environments that drive food choice. And understanding how these value negotiations drive food choice decision making, especially in these changing contexts, is important for aligning policies and interventions for the successful promotion of sustainable healthy diets. And through a synthesis of evidence in the DFC portfolio, we examine how negotiation of values drive food choice in our third webinar in this series scheduled for March. Changing livelihoods is also an important um, consideration that we'll spend some time talking about in, the, in our final webinar, um, and including the social and cultural interactions, time use, and food access, which, dri which drive food choice in different ways. So results from the DFC program offer new evidence on how different forms of changing livelihoods relate to food choice in LMICs in Africa and Asia across production, acquisition, preparation, distribution, and consumption. For example, commuting, being away from home all day, shift work expectations, as well as transitions from say pastoralists to agricultural livelihoods and lifestyles alter time use, travel patterns, and market access. And while a desire for things like home cooked meals with the family or um, longer, uh, especially individually prepared meals, maybe idealized realities of time, energy, and access to ready prepared or pre-processed staples drive choice of these processed and convenient foods, which may or, or may not be less healthy. So understanding relationships between changing livelihoods and food choice has implications for the policies and programs for promotion of sustainable healthy diets that we're all interested in. And we will discuss how livelihood change is driving food choice decision making and behavior in our fourth webinar in this series scheduled for April. So to simultaneously address sustainable healthy food choice that prevents undernutrition and obesity and chronic disease, we need new approaches. Evidence is needed for what works, recognizing this may vary for different populations or contexts. 
And the DFC program has yielded necessary evidence about what, how, and why people eat in low and middle income country contexts and guidance on priorities for action, including those dealing with interactions with formal and informal food markets, perspectives on food safety, shifting cultural values and priorities, and alterations in food choice due to changing livelihoods. And this, this evidence is necessary to foster promising innovations in, in food systems research. An essential next step in food choice research is to pilot these innovations to generate evidence for what works to achieve access to choice of and consumption of sustainable healthy diets and to successfully scale learnings for long-term impact. So we ask that during this full webinar series and especially today that you think about the implications of this research for innovation especially and, and how we might harness this knowledge to develop new or refine existing approaches to figure out what works best. Um, in the end, I'd like to end here with one final question that I pose to you all. Um, so what do you think are some of the most promising innovations targeting food choice for sustainable healthy diets? And I ask that um, you, as you think about these, you share any responses to this question or questions you may have about um, what works in the chat box. And we can come back to this point in our discussion at the end. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. So now we'll move to a presentation um, that'll be done jointly um, with M Miriam Matita and, and Helen Walls on the work that they led. Um, thanks very much, Ed. So I'm just sharing my screen. Excellent. Perfect. So that's perfect. <laughs> Great. Um, excellent, okay. Um, so our presentation is on household um, participation in food markets and dietary diversity. And we're presenting here evidence from our work in rural Malawi. Um, and Miriam and I are doing a double act, I guess you could say, with this presentation. Um, so um, I'm going to take you through some of the introductory slides. Um, and then Miriam's going to present um, our study um, and, its, and its findings. So the presentation is based on a study which is about to be published in Global Food Security, um, which has been led by Miriam. And it's part of a larger program of work on agricultural policy, food choice and dietary diversity in Malawi, um, which has been funded by the Drivers of Food Choice um, Competitive Grants Program. Um, and we'd like to acknowledge um, our co-authors on the work. Um, and we also dedicate the study to the memory of our colleague, Professor Chiwa, um, who very sadly passed away um, during this work. So addressing malnutrition in contexts um, such as rural Malawi um, with very food insecure populations um, involves increasing nutritional quality through improving dietary diversity, um, as well as addressing hunger through increasing um, calories consumed. With dietary diversity, the Household Dietary Diversity Score, or the HDDS, is widely used as an indicator of dietary diversity and nutritional quality. But what actually shapes people's diets? Um, there are, are, of course, more upstream determinants of this, including agricultural policy, um, but more sort of proximal or close to the individual is the local food environment. So the food environment is the link or that interface that mediates people's food acquisition and consumption with the wider food system that includes agricultural production. Food environments are made up of the foods available to people in their surroundings as they go about their everyday lives, and also the characteristics of these food, um, some of which are described here on the slide. Um, food environments include the sources of these food um, foods, and these sources can include things like own production, um, local markets, um, as well as grocery stores and perhaps supermarkets in more high income or urban settings. And there's been a lot of attention given in the, in the past few years to understanding food environments and what shapes them and how they influence individual and community diets. So to turn specifically to the situation in Malawi, Malawi has a very significant burden of malnutrition and poor health associated with this. 
Um, for example, over a third of children aged um, under five years are stunted or chronically malnourished. And in Malawi, um, diets are, are very much dominated by maize, um, which is often consumed as um, in sema, which I've got pictured here um, alongside some rice in the background. Um, so maize makes up more than 50% of household calorie intake um, and is grown by about 90% of households with access um, to land. Um, and here I've got a picture of Nsema being cooked in a village um, in which we did our field work. So in Malawi, there is only a single rainy season with the rest of the year being fairly dry. And this has a big influence on agricultural production, food prices and diets. Um, soils in Malawi are also quite depleted of nutrients. So the government's strategy for improving agricultural production um, has over the years focused on providing fertilizer and seed subsidies to smallholder farmers. And these subsidies, they've been um, usually, but not, not completely, um, focused on, on maize. Um, so for example, the Farm Input Subsidy Program or the FISP of recent years, um, which um, as has actually been recently replaced by a new, a new program. So most households in rural Malawi grow crops, um, predominantly maize, but most do not produce enough food to see them through the year um, and rely on markets to access food. Also, households grow a wider variety of crops than they actually consume, which suggests that own, own farm production is not the biggest driver of dietary, dietary diversity, and this again suggests a role for food markets. Um, so food markets, of course, being an important aspect of um, local food environments in, in the, this setting. So a recent review um, found a positive relationship between market access and dietary diversity in a number of studies. And in Malawi specifically, um, several studies have found um, small um, but positive effects of farm production diversity on dietary diversity. Um, but market participation has actually been found to be a more important um, determinant of dietary diversity. But the studies um, on which the, the, this is based, um, they use different measures, different metrics of food market access, and these, um, these measures are often quite crude. So the Malawi studies examined market participation in terms of existence of local markets um, and distance to markets, rather than looking at actual um, market purchases. So there's a need for more evidence um, 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 and also improved methods of data collection and analysis um, to understand the relationships between market participation, food choices, dietary diversity um, in, in different contexts. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this um, conceptual framework in detail, but it does, um, it, it's a visual conceptualization of the relationships between agricultural factors, household income, market participation, food choice, um, dietary diversity, and um, nutrition and health outcomes. Um, so just to sort of recap, to date, not many studies have actually empirically examined relationships between agricultural factors, food market participation, and dietary diversity. Um, and those that have done so have often used quite crude um, metrics. So in this study, we looked at the relationship between engagement with food markets, um, which we've called food market participation, um, and dietary diversity in rural Malawi. Um, and we have explored this in the context of wider agricultural factors, such as seasonality and um, the FISC or the Farm Input Subsidy Program. Um, and to do this, we've also developed a new measure of um, food market participation, which we call the Food Purchases Diversity Score. Um, so I'm going to hand over um, to Miriam now to explain um, the methods and results, including the new metric. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, in terms of the methods for this study, we collected data from uh, 400 rural households in two districts of rural Malawi in the post-harvest season, as well as the lean period. Uh, we selected one traditional authority in each district. Uh, the difference between the two districts that we selected is that the Lilongwe district is dominated by maize cultivation, whereas Palombe district is more mixed farming uh, focused. Uh, these participants of the study were randomly selected 
And the, in terms of the analytical approach, we use the Poisson regression analysis uh, to analyze this data that is unbalanced panel. Next slide. Oh. Okay. So as Helen has explained, uh, our new measure, we are calling it the food purchases diversity score. And we have constructed this as the count of number of food groups purchased by household in the past seven days. As mentioned, uh, previous studies have looked at market participation, but then they were more concerned with the distance to the uh, district market, existence of a local market. But in this study, we are using the actual purchases, the incidence of the purchases that a household has made uh, in the measurement of food consumption. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we are showing uh, some of the people that participated in the study design and data collection, as well as the analysis. Uh, in one of the pictures there, that's me and Helen, uh, in one of the uh, data analysis meetings that we had. So what do our results show? Uh, in terms of the descriptive statistics, uh, next slide. Uh, the average household consumed four food groups out of the four food groups. Next slide, Helen. Helen, next slide. No, not this one. Okay. All right. In terms of the food groups, out of 12 possible food groups, uh, a household consumed uh, four food groups and the we found that dietary diversity was higher in the lean period than in the uh, post-harvest period. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Not the one currently shown. You want the, the, the descriptive <laughs> results. Helen, I think that, right now we see the slide still with um, yourself and your photos. team. Maybe uh, you I think need I've... to close the PowerPoint and open it again and, and present. Right, okay. Um... Sorry about this. Um... Is that better? Yeah, that's the one, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're saying that in terms of the descriptive statistics, uh, in our study, uh, households consumed four food groups out of the 12 food groups that were possible. And we found that dietary diversity was lower during the lean period uh, than in the post-harvest season. Uh, in terms of the purchases in food groups, households purchased at least the four food groups in the market, which was slightly higher than what they were consuming. Uh, given that in Malawi, there has been this farm input subsidy program for some time, uh, about 39% of the household uh, were member, uh, people that benefited from this program, while 72% 72 have ever participated in the program since it started in 2005, six. Uh, in this setting, uh, maize is the dominant crop under cultivation uh, and the, some households, about 76%, reported uh, cultivating at least uh, one type of grass, commonly groundnuts and beans. Next slide. Uh, in this slide, we are showing the food purchases by households uh, over the past seven days. And what we likely find is that uh, households in the past food day, uh, past seven days, uh, purchased uh, food groups in the categories of oils, fats, fish, uh, condiments and spices and vegetables, uh, at least 50% of them reported having uh, purchased these food groups. But we also see that there are few uh, market purchases in milk and milk products, uh, eggs and fruits. When we go to the lean season, which is the black and dots, uh, 
there's a decrease in purchases of eggs, meat, and slightly for oils and fats and fish, but overall a general distract, de 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 decline in the uh, food market purchases that the households were making, except for spices and condiments. And then for the cereals, we see that there is a, a double decline in the amount that was being purchased. Next. Okay, in this figure, we looked at the food consumed by households over the past 24 hours, and likely households are, are consuming cereals, vegetables in both lean and post harvest season. Uh, but then all other food groups experienced a decline in what households were uh, consuming, except for condiments, uh, spices, and beverages, which uh, we observed that there was an increase in the lean season. Uh, on what households we are consuming. Next. Uh, here we are looking at the household dietary diversity by number of food categories that had purchases. And what we find is that uh, overall, there's an indication of a positive trend uh, in the relationship between uh, food market purchases and dietary diversity. Uh, households that did not uh, purchase any food group like Zelo they had a mean dietary diversity score of three food groups. Whereas those that uh, purchased it food from 12 food groups, they had a dietary diversity score of about uh, uh, six. And this uh, positive relationship was also confirmed with our correlation uh, analysis that was significant at uh, 1%. We also did the regression analysis, next slide of the determinants of household dietary diversity. We here only present uh, selected coefficient and standard errors from the regression results that we have, uh, but there were several uh, regressions that we, were, we did. So overall, the findings that we have using the panel data analysis, uh, which is the second column there, uh, we found that households uh, that purchased uh, food uh, experienced an inc uh, are likely to experience an increase in uh, dietary diversity by 0 0.019 times. So they would have a higher uh, household dietary diversity than those that did not. Uh, and again, in the lean season, uh, the household dietary diversity was lower than the post-harvest season. When we split the data between the lean season and the post-harvest season, what we found was that uh, Still, our measure of food purchase diversity score was significantly influencing household dietary diversity. But what is of more concern was that the large-scale program that the government is implementing, the farm input subsidy program, was not influencing the household dietary diversity. Uh, these models they included uh, control variables, uh, including age of the household head, asset, uh, and the gender of the household head, among others. Next slide. So what we are finding use, using this method, which we are saying it's more rigorous than previous approaches, we are finding that there is a clear association between food market participation uh, and household dietary diversity in rural Malawi. And that households that engaged with food markets were more likely to have more diversified food diets. Uh, and then we also found that diets were lower in the lean season when households in this context, they face food shortages uh, from own production and there's reduced income that they have. And at the same time, they also face higher maize prices. So that's the, the setting in which they are and the diets were found to be lower in that season. But there's no evidence between uh, the association of uh, cultivating legumes and dietary diversity. Much as uh, that is a concern, we, we are saying that it, uh, cultivating legumes is just one of the major for farm production diversity. There could be other measures that can be used. And besides, the many other studies uh, have found that the effects of farm production diversity on dietary diversity have been all open small. Next, please. 
Further results show that the sperm input subsidy program, the FISIP, does not appear to have uh, affected food choices and dietary diversity in any significant way. Although the design of the program was to promote uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture by providing households with legume seeds in addition to improving maize, uh, improved maize seeds that they were getting and the fertilizer. So that intention seems not to be uh, achieved. And in keeping with our study, Opemara Jao 2017 found that access to food markets was more important than dietary diversity, uh, of, uh, than diversity of farm production. So what are the limitations of this study? Uh, as with household dietary diversity, the farm production, dietary uh, farm production diversity does not reflect the quantity purchased or the quantity and type of foods that a household purchased. Similarly, uh, we were not able to account for whether the foods that were being purchased were processed or not. And uh, besides that, we could not distinguish between foods that were purchased for home consumption, resale, or a combination of the two. And uh, the study results should be taken with caution because this is a localized study in two districts in Malawi. And uh, what we are encouraging other people is to validate uh, this measure that we are proposing uh, with national representative data in different uh, contexts. Next. So in conclusion, uh, we are saying that uh, we have used a new metric of food purchase diversity, uh, which we are calling the food purchase diversity score to measure food market participation. And households with higher food market participation had higher dietary diversity. The association of farm production diversity with dietary diversity was less clear in the results that we have. But what we have is that also food market participation supported food security during the lean season. This was more observed with the increase in purchases of cereals, uh, which signifies that it, it's important in diets of Malawians for our food security. And besides that, because for one to purchase things in the market, then they need the income to be able to do that. So this study also points to the importance of household incomes uh, in uh, increasing food market uh, participation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Helen and, and uh, Miriam. So our last presentation is um, gonna be given by Sigrid. So uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I will share my screen. Um, good. Yeah, you see it? Yeah, yes, but not the slideshow. There you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. After um, the load of presentation, I will try to wrap up uh, um, insights from Vietnam. And I'm happy really to take you to the transformation of the food retail environment and the dynamics in food consumption of low income urbanites um, in Hanoi. Um, Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam and it's a very ancient city, um, as you can see from these pictures, but it's also changing, urbanizing and modernizing very rapidly. And the combination of this urban modernization with uh, increasing concerns about food safety uh, related to agrochemical contaminations, but also in hygienic vending practices, for instance, is actually driving the transformation of the food retail environment. Um, uh, with regards to this food retail environment, it is quite important to understand that Vietnam, like many other, other countries, has a kind of formal, that is um, uh, organized often by the state or by local authorities uh, with licensing and so on, and an informal uh, structure. And this informal structure is mostly self-organized. And in Vietnam, um, this is quite uh, a, a, yeah, a, a well-known phenomenon also by the ambulance street hawkers walking the streets with uh, foods on the poles. 
Um, the traditional structure in Vietnam is really um, yeah, on uh, this open air market based structures, whether formal or informal, and this is now rapidly changing towards indoor air conditioned uh, supermarket style and chain convenience style uh, vending. So the policymakers in Vietnam, they are really concerned about food safety and they uh, really embrace supermarket development and actually actually stimulate the development of supermarkets since private owned companies are known to uh, uh, maintain certain levels of hygienic uh, management um, uh, uh, systems, as well as also monitoring food safety and production. Um, so the policy is really designed to reduce the amount of open air formal wet markets and to stimulate supermarket development. And on the screen, you also see uh, a mapping of the reduction of traditional markets in the period uh, yeah, 20, 2012 to 2020 uh, nowadays. And then you see it has a huge impact that a lot of markets uh, have already been or are still uh, being reduced in, in different sites in the city. Um, and during this presentation, I hope you wonder with me, actually question also with me the ability of policymakers to steer consumption into aimed for directions. Because the idea of the policymakers is that uh, supermarkets provide for more controlled and safe and hygienic shopping uh, environments. And so the whole idea about this retail modernization is to steer consumers into supermarket based shopping practices. Now, then the big question is, of course, what does this do with particularly the urban poor? Because um, supermarkets are mostly privatized corporations, uh, not all in Vietnam, but most they are, and uh, especially nowadays. And so they tend to invest in areas with middle or higher income uh, populations. But it is very important to focus on these low income urbanites, since, of course, most of the people, 70% in 2050, will live in urban areas, but moreover, 50% of this urban world population will live in Asia. And many of these urbanites, which we also call um, the, the urbanization of poverty, they will be poor. And Hanoi is definitely a case in point. Um, I will share with you some results from our research and I'm very grateful to all the people um, I've worked with, my, my co-researchers, as well as, as the women who participated in our research. Um, and, um, Therewith, I would like to take you in our project, Retail Diversity for Dietary Diversity, to uncover several drivers of food choice. But before going there, I would like you to pause for just a couple of seconds and to think about what percentage uh, of Hanoi citizens has a low income. And in, with a low income, we think about less than five US dollar per capita per day. So just think about it, um, ponder a bit. Now, actually, it's nearly 50% of the urban population that can be considered low-income uh, low urbanites. These are data from a couple of years ago, but anyway, it indicates that it's a super large group. So it's very important to think about the consequences of this policy that drives this retail modernization for the uh, dietary intake of these urban poor. So the research questions in our project were how do these urban poor or these low-income urbanites uh, cope with this progressing food retail transformation. So what about uh, the, the, uh, the reduction in markets, for instance? And then next, how and to what extent does this impact the dietary intake in terms of both nutrition uh, composition, the diversity of the diet, as well as the food safety of the products they consume? Now, to study this, we took a consumption practices approach, which means that dietary intake was measured, but was mostly assessed not as directly depending on the food environment, but actually directly dependent on the food consumption practices in which both the food environment as well as the changing lifestyles of urbanite play in. So we see actually, we assessed the transformation of the food environment on the dietary intake mitigated by food consumption practices. Now, going a bit more in depth on these food uh, consumption practices, we focus particularly on, on home consumption. So shopping for food, as well as preparing and consuming food at home. And yeah, this is a kind of dynamic relation between the food retail in, uh, uh, environment that is rapidly changing, as well as the lifestyles of all these urbanites that is 
also really changing. Yeah? The, the city is changing, um, uh, the household compositions are changing, and their employment is changing. And this all impacts the way people uh, shop and prepare and consume food. Now, the methods we deployed in our study, study are actually also kind of mixed methods, sequential mixed method design, um, where we started with measuring. Now, first, we started to map the food environment. What actually uh, is the food environment of the consumers we want to study? And we took two inner city districts in Hanoi, and there we uh, classified all the different types of outlets, so for a supermarket, but also convenience store, a wet market, an informal market, and each got it. Uh, each uh, type of outlet got its own icon and we mapped that. And based on this mapping, we were able to um, have a stratified sampling for the inclusion of respondents. So since we um, focused on urban uh, poor, low, in low income urbanites, uh, we took um, the parameter of 300 meters from the home uh, um, is as a proximity uh, parameter actually for uh, food retail um, accessibility. So for instance, urban poor don't always have a, a lot of means uh, for transportation. So most of the, the, uh, the food shopping is done uh, by food. And so we took um, four groups in which one group had a, a supermarket and a wet market within walking distance from their home. Another group had only a supermarket within walking distance from their home. A third one, only a wet market within a uh, uh, walking distance from their home. And the fourth group had neither a supermarket nor a wet market within a uh, walking distance from their home. And we focused on wet markets and supermarkets since that was also the focus of the food retail modernization policy. Um, we had a total 400 uh, respondents um, and then, of course, equally divided over these four groups. Now, these re respondents were subjected to a survey to measure um, their household food shopping practices in terms of the frequency, the times of the day, uh, what type of products they were purchasing where. And we not only looked at their practices, but also assessed their preferences. Um, besides, we also look at risk perception and trust in food safety related to their food shopping and consumption practices. This was complemented by um, a 24-hour dietary uh, recall um, among the same group of people, so the same 400 women. Um, and then this 24-hour diet recall was uh, combined with also asking about the place of purchase. So we could directly relate what people ate to where they purchased in relation to the food environment they live in, as well as in relation to the survey we conducted on their food consumption practices. So we measured all their uh, doings related to uh, their dietary intake in relation to the food environment. But I didn't deliver us understandings yet about how and why they um, yeah, did consume the foods in the way um, they did. So we followed up with a qualitative research and then we took a multi-generational approach. And the reason for a multi-generational approach on a subsample of these 400 women was because we wanted to also understand the shifts in practices, the shifts that people have encountered during changes in the food environment, during changes in their lifestyles, in relation to changes in uh, conceptions about what consists food security, nutrition, and food safety. Um, and also we want to capture the, 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 yeah, the inner household dynamics. And this was particularly important because uh, many urban poor, they live still in multi-generational household settings. Now, we complemented this also with a film essay to voice these urban poor also firsthand, showing how they uh, prepare and consume and shop for their foods, as well as telling about what they are doing. And I think this is very important to have also the evidence firsthand, also when encountering in discussions with policymakers. So the results are uh, presented in different papers, so I, I won't go in depth, but we have a paper on the methods about the quantitative research, the qualitative research, as well as the policy. But I will now highlight some of the key learnings across these different um, papers. So first of all, what was quite striking is that all women um, actually appeared to shop in open air markets whether it are formal wet markets or informal street markets. So on the question, where do you buy most of your foods? Actually, no one uh, answered that that was the supermarket. We only had one case. 
And uh, most of the of the women, they shop either at a wet market when a wet market was available within walking distance or at informal street markets. So next, we also found out that most of the nutrition comes from markets. So it's not surprisingly that most of the foods consumed, 70% of the foods consumed originated from these traditional markets where most people are shopping. But what was quite striking that of the foods consumed, only 7% of the foods uh, consumed, uh, of the ultra processed food consumed originated from these uh, traditional markets, whereas actually 84% of the ultra processed food consumed originated from this modern retail outlet, as well as convenience stores that only contributed in total to 90% of the food consumed. So here um, you can see that the women were still um, able to maintain a minimally adequate diet, nutritional diet from these traditional markets. But one can wonder if these traditional markets are done away with, might that not result in increased intake of ultra processed food consumed, given the fact that most of these uh, processed foods were purchased at modern outlets. So then we, we, we wanted to dive in a bit deeper. And so it looks like the food environment transformation do not necessarily lead to changes in food practices and particularly the food shopping practices. But there is something uh, underneath here. And we wanted to understand also why people do not uh, frequent supermarkets more often and also for a wider assortment. And first of all, what we learned is that supermarkets are not fully trusted to offer better food safety than traditional markets. So I have some illustrative quotes uh, and many women uh, had similar quotes. Here is a quote that someone said from, yeah, I was, uh, it was in the news that supermarkets erased all the expiry dates and replaced them by new expiry dates. Or that supermarkets said uh, that people saw how supermarket purchased actually vegetables from the informal market and then reselling it in the supermarket. And all in all, that gave the impression that supermarkets might seem safe and also their packaging and all their advertising around it might make it seem safe, <clears throat> but most people don't believe it. And then in return, you see a different type of, of, of trust mechanism that familiar vendors that sell within the neighborhood, uh, they will really take care about food safety because if there is one case of food poisoning, for instance, and the whole neighborhood would, would know it and would talk about it and then the vendor would be out of business. So there is a real rationale and driver for vendors to make sure the food they sell is safe. Um, and this also relates to, to, to what we measured on price and, and, uh, and, and income spent on food. So overall, 44% of the income, which is not unsurprising given um, our target audience being low income urbanites, is spent on food. And if we compare supermarket to market pricing, then we see that markets are 35% uh, less expensive than supermarkets. Now, given the fact that vegetables are not a very expensive item in the daily um, uh, menu, uh, supermarkets could still be considered affordable. But given the fact that supermarkets are not considered more convenient or more safe, most people prefer to shop at markets. Why paying more? And next also, um, food safety is mitigated actually by everyday fresh food shopping. How we see quotes from people that say, when we eat vegetables in the evening, we buy them uh, that day fresh, or I buy fish when they are swimming, meat from vendors that are quickly sold out, and vegetables from people who bring veggies directly from the countryside. So hey, this is this everyday fresh connotation is also a guarantee um, for taking care of food safety. But also eating leftovers is considered unsafe. And here we have a quote that is also one among uh, multi to avoid cancer. We do not eat leftover food and eat everyday fresh food. Now, given this everyday fresh, a lot of women consider traditional vending uh, to provide better convenience in their time constrained lifestyles. So given the fact that we did multi-generational uh, interviews, we often encountered that the mothers or the mothers-in-law, the elderly women, really considered supermarkets as aspiring. Um, they still grew up in, in periods where there was food scarcity and for them the supermarket is, uh, very, yeah, is, is actually the way to go. But when you talk with their daughters or their daughters-in-law, they don't consider these supermarkets as fitting with their daily lifetimes. So this is again a quote in which a woman says, 
I buy all the vegetables at the market. It's very, it's convenient. Ha, on my way to work, I go to the vendor, ask her to clean and cut the vegetables for me. Then the veg vendor will wrap it in a plastic bag and give it to my mom later. And also the vegetables can be delivered to my home. So this is for them on a daily basis, much more convenient. But then again, one can wonder if there is no uh, formal wet market or also uh, policymakers are trying to clean the streets from uh, street vending. So how do then these people um, yeah, purchase their foods? And actually what we see, instead of going to the supermarket, there is a lot of informal creative agency. So people organize um, these food vending uh, practices themselves. So for instance, people start selling in their house or people rent other, other people's ground floor to evade selling in the streets. So here you see a picture in an example where a woman is sitting in the gate. And so when the police would come and to sweep the, the streets clean, she could easily move within the gate. Or also they have buying collectives. And here you have uh, an, an example from a teacher who says that I have some colleagues with relatives in the countryside and once a week huh, they send the vegetables to the school to be sold to all of us. But moreover, and actually maybe also more important, a lot of these dynamics are going online. And if you look at the policy makers are driving this formalization and this modernization of this the retail, actually what we see happening among these lower income groups, they are driving these people into this kind of informal and also informal online communities that are beyond the scope of control of policy makers. So for instance, we have here again, some, uh, some quotes and examples at my academy, there's an online market, a so-called countryside market of the academy, and teachers sell their homemade foods there. And so it's all online. Or uh, you have also buying groups at Facebook, but also buying directly from people living in certain areas. So as here, the, the, the quote uh, on uh, buying fish from people living in coastal areas, and that's then shipped to the city. So all in all, it seems that uh, people uh, do not really change their shopping practices and also they are able to accommodate themselves to maintain these traditional patterns. And then they also are able to maintain minimally adequate diets. However, we do see that consumption patterns are shifting. So all this measuring did not uncover these yeah, dynamics in these changing um, dietary uh, diets of these urban uh, urbanites in Hanoi. So here we see that diet in processed meats is increasing and the intake of uh, sugar sweetened beverages is also increasing um, and also narrowing the gap between the West and, and, and the East, so to say. And then again, I would like you to, 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 to briefly reflect on what you think, what percentage of children in the age group five to 12 years old in this case is severely overweight or obese in Hanoi. So considering that Vietnam is not yet a country um, uh, yet facing um, large percentages of obesity, what do you think is happening among these children? Any ideas of the percentage? Actually, the answer is quite, um, yeah, actually worrisome. 36.2% uh, of the children in the age group 5 to 12 years in the inner city districts of Hanoi is considered severely overweight or obese. This is not coming from our study. This is a study from the National Institute of Nutrition in Vietnam, where we wanted to understand how come that we can't measure uh, the dietary shift while we see them happening and how can we uncover the dynamics underneath. And what we found is that actually the diets are shifting um, towards accommodating children preferences. And this is not so surprisingly when you know the history of Vietnam. So especially the grandmoms, they have suffered from food scarcity in the past. Um, in, in, in Vietnam, that you even had the coupon system where you could only get food in, in return for a coupon. And, and, and the elderly people also remember very well that a lot of their children were stunted. And the reduction in stunting in Vietnam is one of the biggest accomplishments over the past decades. So the idea huh, that they suffered in the past also relates that children will eat well when they like the food they consume. So for these families, it's very important that they accommodate the children's taste. So you have a lot of quotes like, our family menu is tailored to the children. My kids will not eat what they don't like. If they don't eat, their health and their development is not guaranteed. So this is really coming from the past when people consider their lives as quite miserable and having no choice. 
And then secondly, what we see happening that in, in due time, of course, the food environment beyond food shopping has changed dramatically. And a lot of children, they, 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 they crave for Kentucky fried chicken, uh, fried uh, French fried for pizzas, etc. And of course, these urban poor can't afford to go out for dinner and to, can't go out to fast food restaurants. So what we see happening is that they adopt this kind of dishes in their home kitchen. So we see actually how a traditional uh, plant-based healthy diet is being shifting towards mostly meat-based and more frying-based uh, diets. And um, still, a lot of the older people are not suffering from overweight because the Vietnamese, like you can see on the picture, have, uh, have a habit of having different dishes. So people pick what they like. But then, of course, the, these kids also pick what they like and that are mostly fried chicken wings uh, and then combined with soft drinks or homemade lemonade or to copy these aspirational uh, menus for children. And this then also results in severe overweight also among these low income urbanites. So many uh, yeah, there was, uh, many discussions have been in Vietnam that related that children are becoming more obese because they go to fast food restaurants. But actually we see how children among low income uh, groups that can't go to, to these fast food outlets are also becoming increasingly severely overweight and obese. And my grandson weighs 40 kg, but is just eight years old. And people are aware that the food they consume is unhealthy and that um, this is called obesity, but still this whole idea about accommodating children taste is dominating and shifting whole menus. So last but not least, huh, what does this all say? Coming back to the, pre the question where I started with, uh, how, to what extent policymakers are able to steer uh, consumer into aim for directions? I think policymakers today are facing challenges on the one hand huh, that um, the retail modernization, which has uh, maybe a good rationale, is the okay? Sorry, I hear some people. I have some questions. Okay, sorry, I thought someone was asking a question. Um, but it's resulting in unintentional consequences. So on the one hand, you can see, see that if you push people into supermarkets that might stimulate less healthy diets, like the increased uptake of uh, ultra processed foods, or on the other hand, if you do away with traditional vending um, infrastructures, you might deprive people from access to nutritious foods. And then you, there and you see also a conflicting duality for policymakers in governing food security, balancing on the one hand access to nutritious foods, especially fresh and plant based foods, and also um, ensuring food safety. And especially yeah, when we see that people are going informally online, yeah, how do you then guarantee also the safety of the foods consumed? And this is actually where where we are, um, um, yeah, where we are now in, in, in discussing like how can you share this responsibility with citizens? Huh? How can you co-create um, solutions? But also, and I think that's a step before that, also articulate the problem that citizens are confronted with. And this is particularly important with low-income urbanites, given that policies tend to mostly accommodate uh, middle and higher income classes, giving the supermarketization mostly being uh, developing in higher and middle income class areas. Um, and this is also where we um, like to advance our further research, where I will also leave it today in looking at sharing these responsibilities and better engaging with these different types of citizens. So, and I would also like to um, invite you to watch the documentary in which this low-income urbanite voice the problems they face as well as the solutions they create themselves uh, within our documentary, Retail Diversity for Dietary Diversity, which is now available online. And this leads me to thank um, the whole consortium with whom we have been able to work this and also with whom we can still um, advance uh, insight. And so I very much welcome um, yeah, discussions uh, and, 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 and yeah, cross-cutting learning on how to move um, yeah, uh, food system transitions, um, including this low income urbanites uh, to sustainable, healthy and safe dietary patterns. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sigrid. So uh, we, have, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, th there's uh, 
uh, several questions have been posted. Some of them have been answered in the chat. So I'm going to focus on um, maybe a couple of questions that I think are of broad interest. One of them is um, uh, someone named Gigi raised the question about um, the trade-off between satisfying hunger, so making choices to satisfy hunger versus making choices to uh, for, for healthy diets. And uh, maybe, Christine, you could comment on that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Yes, Gigi, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that's a fundamental, you know, fundamental question of, of why, you know, that, that we do, we address from the very beginning of our, our program, you know, the idea is if, where is their choice? And I think the main point is that with emerging markets and with changes, and as people shift from subsistence or um, where there are, are constraints and have more access understanding how choices are made and what drives those choices before sort of some of the, the um, ultra processed or uh, packaged food kind of behaviors become too common is really important. So some of it is preemptive. Um, the other point is, and Sunita made a really nice comment in the chat box about this as well, that even in, in constraint, there is a certain degree of choice. Right, so there's the choice about who gets what food and how much of different combinations are consumed. And you can think about this in particular with young children or with the elderly and, and allocating different foods or different um, amounts of food to different people. And that's an important consideration as well as, well as considerations about even with growing food, what to buy or what to sell um, and how that's used then to engage with markets. So I think even in cons um, resource constrained areas, the issue of choice and autonomy is still important with the recognition that autonomy will be constrained by access and income. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for, for Sigrid, um, you, you commented on uh, or showed us that a policy intended to improve safety of food may be having the consequence of making it uh, harder for people to have healthy diets. But um, Brenda, points out that another possible cost is creating livelihood challenges for the people working in these traditional and wet markets. And could you comment briefly on that, please? Yeah, it's a very valuable comment. So thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, we've also published on it. I will keep very brief. So a lot of these uh, informal vending structures consist of people also living in those areas. So very important also for shopping in these informal structures is also to take care of other people's livelihoods. So people can relate to the poverty of the vendors as well as the poverty of the consumers. So they are in the, in, in the same field and so they tend to also to support each other. Um, and this kind of social cohesion structures are being further strengthened that a lot of these urbanites also still have relations to the countryside where a lot of the vendors also come from. So uh, actually you could say this is a kind of subsystem within this urban uh, food retail system. But I'm happy to discuss this further. Okay, great, thank you. And then, and then a question for uh, Helen and, and Miriam um, that uh, uh, John uh, Muzunda was asking about uh, when, when households decisions to purchase four out of 12 food groups, is that due to, uh, is that low number due to uh, food availability at the markets, affordability, their own food preferences? Is there, can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, briefly about, about why, why that's limited? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a really good question. Um, Miriam, do you want to add, do you want some to add some comments first? Okay. Thank you very much. I think largely it's because of uh, affordability problems, uh, but also uh, in this study that we are we did, we also included market surveys of the food that was available in the localities, and the there were limited limited cases where households reported that uh, from our market survey uh, observation where we noted that specific foods were not available, for example, fish, fresh fish, and some oils, but largely most of the foods were available, meaning that it's more of a challenge of being able to afford the, the different foods the household can consume. But from this study, because we only used asset index to uh, probe for income, maybe we could not say more directly around that aspect. Thank you. Mm, yeah, and I can probably add to that if we like also, because this is one study of a bigger work program, um, and if we draw on the findings that we've, our qualitative findings that, that are going to be published um, in a different paper, 
um, we've, we've conducted interviews with people in the villages and often they, they, um, they talk about what is healthy, they're very aware of what is healthy food, but they just say they're unable to afford these healthy foods. Um, and we also did some um, a discrete choice experiment. Um, so we've got some experimental data um, based on food basket scenarios. Um, and we found that when we lowered the price of maize, people would still prefer to consume more maize, would still opt for a basket which, which um, had mostly maize in it rather than a more diverse um, basket, which I think just really speaks to um, like the, the, the food insecurity that's being faced by, by these people. Um, so, so price being a, a really significant issue. Okay, thank you very much. So we're, we're at full time. And I, I think in respect for uh, other things that people have in their schedule, we'll, we'll wrap this up. I want to thank uh, all our presenters, Christine, uh, Miriam, Helen, and Sigrid. Uh, and also thank Sylvia and Abel and others uh, at a &H Academy for making this possible. Uh, Abel has put in the uh, chat box the uh, registration link for the next webinar. We encourage you to register for that. And thank you very much for participating and for your questions um, and, and for your, um, your thoughts about this. Uh, there's some questions in the chat box that we didn't get to that uh, we'll direct to the investigators uh, for them to follow up. So thank you very much uh, and have a great rest of the day.